This is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I am um, honored to welcome you all to our second discussion on the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail. And I am not going to belabor the hour because we have individuals who have prepared to lead this discussion and presentation. And I think that we'll get right into it, but I would like to open with a word of prayer. So will you join me? Gracious God, we give you thanks for this day and for this opportunity to come together to reason as your people. Lord God, you have sent prophets um, in times past and in present day to tell us what thus saith the Lord, to encourage us to be your people, to love one another, to treat one another with equity and equality and justice. And Lord, it seems that we need to be reminded over and over and over again what you require of us. And so we give you thanks that you have brought us together this day to reason together, to study the words that Dr. King wrote. I'm certain under your Holy Spirit's guidance to help us to be better people, to help us to be the people of God. And so as we discuss today, I pray that your spirit would be in the midst of everything that is presented, everything that is discussed, everything that is said. Lord God, we are not afraid to tackle with issues that often divide because we know that you are with us. And so be with us now. We thank you for Dr. Beverly and Dr. Linda and all those who were on the team that put this presentation together. We give you thanks for the leadership of our Facing Systemic Racism Committee, uh, Michelle and Lenore, and for all of the committee members. And we just give you thanks that we are a people who are not afraid to be uncomfortable. We are not afraid. Be with us now. In Christ's name we pray. Amen forget who I'm turning it over to, but someone out there knows. It would be me. <laughs> uh, thank you, Pastor Cersei, and welcome to everyone who's gathered here this afternoon. The Facing Systemic Racism Committee was formed last October and is charged with helping East Liberty Presbyterian Church continuously work to become an anti-racist church. To that end, our most recent program is a three-part series on Dr. Martin Luther King's letter from the Birmingham jail. Our first session was, was presented in January by Pastor Randy. And at that time, we didn't know what changes were ahead. His background on the letter, which he shared, provides us a strong foundation for the work ahead. Thank you so much, Pastor Randy. And uh, I didn't know about the quiz, Pastor Randy, but thanks for informing us of that. If you are unable to attend the presentation or were unable to attend it and would like to see it, you may contact Pastor Patrice. Today, Dr. Beverly Harris Schentz will present session two, Just and Unjust Laws. Dr. Beverly is one of our siblings in Christ here at ELPC and believes that learning accurate information about our nation's history is essential in achieving the ideals of democracy and to serve the cause of social justice. Teaching was and is her calling. She has 38 years of experience. And as they say, once a teacher, always a teacher. She is back at it here at ELPC. With this encore teaching engagement, she would like her legacy to be providing us and facilitating challenges, challenging and respectful conversations about race. Like all great teachers, Dr. Beverly is a learner as well. She's currently reading the 1619 Project. When I asked her what she learned about race in the United States that surprised her the most, she said how much the important history of people of color has been lost, ignored, or erased. Dr. Beverly helped her students of German at the University of Pittsburgh not only learn a language, but help them see a culture and get a different view of the world. Her work earned her the Chancellor's Distinguished Teaching Award. Today, Dr. Beverly will introduce us to a different way of seeing the world, but she will do it in English. 
It is my pleasure to present to you Dr. Beverly Harris Schitz. Dr. Beverly? Thank you so much, Linda, for such a kind and generous introduction. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. In our first session, Pastor Randy provided an authoritative introduction to the historical and theological context for the letter from a Birmingham jail. There, Dr. King responds to the criticism of eight white clergymen. In this session, I will focus on a seminal issue in that document, just versus unjust laws. Dr. King's detractors chastised him, chastised him for breaking the law, leading a nonviolent march in their city in violation of a federal injunction not to march. They question how this man of God who purports to value laws can break the law when he is asking municipal authorities in Birmingham to obey laws that forbid segregation. Dr. King distinguishes between just and unjust laws. He explains his position in a television interview with Meet the Press from March 28, 1965. So Gretchen, would you help us so that we can watch that show? Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who is in San Francisco. On our panel of reporters in Washington, D.C., you have just met Lawrence Spivak. Our other reporters today are Tom Wickert of the New York Times, James J. Kilpatrick of the Richmond News Leader, and John Chancellor of NBC News. We'll continue the questions now with Mr. Wicker. Uh, Dr. King, you said a moment ago that Alabama was a state that uh, gives respectability to the resistance and defiance of the law. And you listed uh, uh, an observance of the law by local agencies in the South as one of the cardinal aims that you were seeking. Uh, yet on March the 9th, you led the second march on Montgomery in uh, violation of a federal injunction not to march. You said that order was unjust, and John Lewis, one of your colleagues, said that the Negroes had a constitutional right to march injunction or no injunction. Now, was that in keeping with the spirit of nonviolence and the restraint that has always characterized your movement, and could you explain your reasoning in defying the court order that day? Well, let me say two things to that, Mr. Wicker. First, uh, I did not consider myself defying a court order that particular day. I consulted with my attorneys before the march, and they stated that uh, they felt that it was an invalid order and that uh, it would not uh, be that I would not be in contempt of court uh, violating uh, the court order if I led the march uh, to the point of having a moral confrontation with the state troopers at the point where the people were brutalized on Sunday. So I still don't consider that uh, breaking a court order or uh, breaking what I consider an unjust law. On the other hand, I must be honest enough to say uh, that I do feel that there are two types of laws. One is a just law and one is an unjust law. I think we all have moral obligations to obey just laws. On the other hand, I think we have moral obligations to disobey unjust laws because non-cooperation with evil is as much a moral obligation as is cooperation with good. I think the distinction here is that when one breaks a law that conscience tells him is unjust, he must do it openly, he must do it cheerfully, he must do it lovingly, he must do it civilly, not uncivilly, and he must do it with a willingness to accept the penalty. And any man who breaks a law that conscience tells him is unjust and willingly accepts the penalty by staying in jail in order to arouse the conscience of the community on the injustice of the law, is at that moment expressing the very highest respect for law. Well, I can, I can sympathize with a good deal of that, but it seems to me you get into a very difficult point here uh, at which uh, one man's conscience is, is set, in fact, above the conscience of society, which, is, which has uh, invoked the law. Uh, how are we to uh, enforce law when a doctrine is preached that, that one man's conscience may tell him that the law is unjust when other men's conscience don't tell them that. And I think you enforce it and I think you deal with it by not allowing anarchy to develop. I do not believe in defying the law. 
as many of the segregationists do. I do not believe in evading the law, as many of the segregationists do. Uh, the fact is that most of the segregationists and racists that I see are not willing to suffer enough for their beliefs in segregation, and uh, they are not willing to go to jail. I think the chief norm for guiding the situation is the willingness to accept the penalty. And I don't think any society can call an individual irresponsible who breaks the law and willingly accepts the penalty if conscience tells him that that law is unjust. And I think that uh, this is a long tradition in our society. It's a long tradition in biblical history. Uh, Medchak uh, uh, and Abednego broke an unjust law, and they did it because they had to be true to a higher moral law. Uh, the early Christians practiced civil disobedience in a superb manner. Academic freedom would not be a reality today if it had not been for Socrates and if it had not been for Socrates' willingness to practice civil disobedience. And I would say that in our own history, there's nothing that expresses uh, a massive civil disobedience any more than the Boston Tea Party, and yet we give this to our young people and our students as a part of the great tradition of our nation. So I think we are in good company when we break unjust laws, and I think those who are willing to do it and accept the penalty are those who are part of the saving of the nation. Thank you. In this clip, Dr. King argues that we have moral obligations both to obey just laws and to disobey unjust laws. He emphasizes that non-cooperation with evil is just as important as cooperation with good. Those who protest unjust laws must be willing to accept the penalty of their actions, including going to jail. In so doing, they are following their conscience. He identifies moral champions who acted against evil by following their moral conscience. In the Bible, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In classical Greece, Socrates. And in the American historical context, the participants in the Boston Tea Party. Although, ironically, I want to add, these patriots did not accept the consequences of their actions as only one of them was imprisoned. You see, they committed their act disguised as Native Americans. So let's start with a definition. An unjust law is no law at all. This statement acknowledges that authority is not legitimate unless it is good and right. This natural law has become a standard legal maxim around the world, and that is the definition of an unjust law. Unjust laws have occurred throughout history. This is best illustrated with two global examples I'd like to share. First, in apartheid South Africa, the white minority government enacted pass laws, a rigid internal passport system that obliged all black African men to carry a passport. By the way, a similar practice existed for enslaved people in our country. This pass in South Africa was not required of the minority white population, but it was intended to restrict the free movement of black Africans and force them to live near their place of employment. Consequently, black families lived apart and black men could be disrespected, stopped, fined, or jailed at any time if they did not have a pass. In protest, black workers publicly burned their passes and faced imprisonment. Such actions were in defiance of an unjust law. Second, in 1935, the Nazi government instituted the Nuremberg Race Laws. Passed by Parliament, these laws established the legal guidelines for marginalizing, isolating, and dehumanizing all Jews living in Germany. Among them, among the, the stipulations, and they were many of them egregious, the most so was that German Jews were stripped of their citizenship. Furthermore, these laws were the foundation for what would become the plan to eliminate European Jewry. These laws were legal, but clearly unjust. So you might ask, do we have just and unjust laws today in the United States? During overt segregation in this country, it was simple to identify unjust laws because they were obvious. Segregation established separate drinking fountains, schools, restaurants, hotels, job listings, transportation, and public transportation, uh, excuse me, and public accommodations. 
Today, however, the large signs delineating white and Negro or white and colored have disappeared. And one might assume that unjust laws have therefore been relegated to our country's past. However, Dr. King anticipated a movement towards subtle forms of injustice in his letter when he recognized that, quote, sometimes a law is just on its face and unjust in its application, end quote. Exactly that is the current situation in our country. We have innumerable situations in which black and brown people are marginalized because of the ways in which seemingly just laws are applied inequitably or the impact of such laws is inequitable. Let me give you three examples. First, the GI Bill. The federal government induced the GI Bill, introduced, excuse me, the GI Bill officially known as the Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 1944. It was specifically designed for World War II veterans and intended to prevent the financial and re-entry difficulties World War I veterans had encountered when they returned home. The GI Bill provided hospital care, low interest mortgages, stipends for tuition and living expenses to attend college or trade schools, and unemployment benefits for up to one year to those looking for work. Although these benefits should have been available to all veterans, Black veterans face severe discrimination at the hands of all white veterans administrators, both on the local and state levels. They fared best with hospital care. Most banks refused to give them mortgages following a practice known as redlining. In the 1930s, the Federal Home Owners Loan Corporation, or HOLC as it was known, designated areas around the United States as unworthy of loans because of, quote, an infiltration of foreign-born Negro or lower grade population, end quote. The corporation awarded letter grades to neighborhoods, A grades to white areas and Ds to largely non-white areas. This made it virtually impossible for homeowners of color to get mortgages. For example, in 1947, only two of the more than 3,000 VA guaranteed home loans in Mississippi went to black borrowers. And in the same year, in New York and Northern New Jersey suburbs, fewer than 100 of 67,000 mortgages insured by the GI Bill went to non-whites. Coincidentally, just in time for this presentation, the Washington Post reported on March 8th, 2022, that redlining practices of 50 years ago have resulted in 45 million Americans in our country breathing dirtier air. One example they provided is in Boyle Heights, a heavily Latino area near Los, near Los Angeles. Throughout Redlining's history, local zoning officials worked with businesses to place polluting operations such as industrial plants, major roadways, and shipping ports in and around neighborhoods that the federal government had marginalized or redlined. In addition, due to racial prejudice and discriminatory practices, black buyers could not purchase homes in white suburban neighborhoods. Most white colleges and trade schools were segregated and black students were not welcome. Historically, excuse, excuse me, historical black institutions were bursting at the seams and unable to accommodate the enormous influx of potential students. Black veterans unemployment claims were rarely honored and they were often forced into low-end and poorly paid jobs. So that means that a program that was in theory open to all veterans in practice excluded black veterans. This was a just law that was unjust in its implementation and impact. The, ability, the inability of black parents to buy homes and then pass them on to their children has frequently been cited as the primary reason for the racial wealth gap in the United States. Second, new laws restricting voting. In the year 2021, 52 restrictive voting laws were passed in states around our country and 581 restrictive bills were proposed by state legislators. Such laws introduced a broad range of restrictions, such as cutting periods of early voting, reducing, eliminating, or moving polling locations in the inner cities, banning curbside voting, shortening voting hours, eliminating Saturday and weekend voting, eliminating drive-through voting, banning the giving of food or water to those in line, 
shortening the absentee voting window. While some of these changes might appear to be efforts to rationalize resources or streamline the voting process, when the voters affected by such changes are overwhelmingly people of color, then the impact of these decisions are inequitable and thereby raises such laws to the standard of being unjust. I remember the news coverage in November 2020 when journalists asked black and white voters in the greater Atlanta area how long it had taken them to cast their ballots. I was appalled to hear that black voters in urban neighborhoods had waited up to 15 hours to vote, while their white counterparts in the suburbs, not too many miles away, reported that they had waited only 15 minutes to exercise this constitutionally guaranteed right. Is that just? Third, cash bail. On both the local and national level, cash bail is an important issue, especially for minor offenses like disorderly conduct, trespassing, carrying an open container of alcohol, a minor in possession of alcohol, petty theft, vandalism, loitering, resisting arrest, etc. Bail is also levied for serious offenses like murder and kidnapping, but that is not what I'm discussing here. While re researching this topic, I was surprised to learn that only two countries in the world employ cash bail, the United States and the Philippines. That hardly casts our democratic justice, justice system in a positive light, if we are to be judged, as the proverb says, by the company we keep. Given our constitutional guarantee that citizens are innocent until proven guilty, it is appalling to think that between 2015 and 2016, 97,000 persons went to jail in our country, not because of guilt, but because of their inability to post bail. Bail is intended to guarantee that the accused will appear to participate in court proceedings. Since there's no affixed amount for bail, judicial officials determine the appropriate amount based on numerous factors, including prior criminal history, the severity of the current offense, a history of failed court appearances, ties to the community, recommendations of police officers or judicial staff, as well as ability to pay. If the amount assigned is, is excessive, the lawyer of the accused may request a reassessment. Anyone unable to pay the assigned bail is then incarcerated until his or her case comes to trial. The American Civil Liberties Union, however, notes that, quote, there seems to be no evidence that cash bail increases the probability of court appearances, end quote. Now to move to the local scene. The jail population in Allegheny County yields ast astounding statistics. Although African Americans account for only 13% of the county population, they comprise more than 65% of the jail population. The ACLU estimates that nationally, 62% of those held in jail have not been sentenced. Most of them, who should be presumed innocent based on our system, are held because they cannot pay cash bail. Therefore, cash bail creates a system of wealth detention. Those who can pay go free, and those who cannot are imprisoned. The average statewide bail amount in Pennsylvania is $38,433. That is more than half of the average annual household income in the Commonwealth. In addition to loss of liberty, those who cannot pay cash bail experience other serious consequences, including job loss, eviction, family destabilization, loss of child custody, a higher suicide rate in jail, lower jail terms, excuse me, longer jail terms because they are willing to accept plea deals, even if they are innocent, and higher recidivism. The ACLU of Pennsylvania issued a report in December 2021 called Broken Rules, How PA Courts Use Cash Bail to Incarcerate People Before Trial. The authors of that report found that Cash bail is the most common bail used, that ministerial district judges set bail too high, and finally, that Black people are assigned bail more frequently and in larger amounts. Further, the report concludes that the problem is not the law, but rather the magisterial district judges who must follow the law. 
The ACLU recommends that these judges be subjected to more careful oversight by president judges, receive ongoing training, and annual analysis of their decisions. Cash bail is currently being examined by local and state judges as well as the ACLU, local community groups like the Alliance for Police Accountability and civil rights organizations, as well as the Justice Committee here at ELPC. These groups are examining the existing systems, seeking ways to reform it, and recommending possible alternatives. However, in the meantime, our judicial system oversees a network of unjust applications that fly in the face of the United States Constitution that guarantees unbiased justice. In conclusion, I have described the unjust implementation of three laws that may appear just at first glance, but upon closer examination, we see that the application or the impact of these laws is, is unjust. So what is the role of people of faith in the face of injustice? Do we remain silent and thus support the status quo, or do we raise our voices in a chorus of dissent? As the late Archbishop Tutu once said, Quote, when an elephant is stepping on a mouse, the mouse will not be pleased by our neutrality, end quote. Gretchen, could you share the image of Lady Justice? I don't know if we see it. There she is. Thank you. Let's take a look at this image of Lady Justice. She's blindfolded so that she can act impartially in dispensing justice. Our democracy, too, is founded on the ideal, ideals of fairness and impartiality, but it is clearly not living up to these ideals. Thank you, Gretchen. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 and 7, we read, There is an appointed time for everything, and there is a time for every event under heaven. There is a time to be silent and a time to speak. I agree wholeheartedly with these words of Ecclesiastics and also with Dr. King. We, as people of faith, can no longer be silent about injustice. We must speak out. Thank you so much for your attention.